The diver in the background of this picture is Tina Watson, and this is literally her last moment before she died while scuba diving on her honeymoon in Australia. Other divers accidentally captured this image while on a dive of their own, without knowing Tina was in the background until after they developed the pictures. What seemed to be just an accident turned into something much darker. Tina Watson was 26 years old when in October of 2003 she married Gabe Watson. The couple had met in college in Alabama, where they both lived, and had been dating since 2001. On October 11th of 2003, they celebrated their wedding and then set off to their honeymoon in Australia, where they planned to scuba dive through the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest coral reef system. Some of the dives in the area are recommended only for experienced divers. Gabe had a lot of experience with over 55 dives completed and being a qualified rescue diver for a state park lake. However, Tina had only earned her certification a few months earlier. Her total experience when she flew to Australia was five dives. She had also never dived in the ocean before. Despite her lack of experience, the couple took on a dive to reach the wreckage of the Yesas Yongala, which sank in 1911 and has since become a popular challenge for those visiting the reef. They refused taking the visit with a qualified guide and experienced diver and decided to venture on their own. On October 22nd, at 10.30am, and after only a few minutes in the water, Gabe resurfaced and asked for help. Tina had lost consciousness and was sinking to the bottom. He said the currents were strong and Tina got scared, so he urged her to go back to the diving rope. However, Gabe said Tina accidentally knocked his mask, and by the time he was able to see her again, she was sinking too fast and he couldn't reach her. The diving instructor on the boat rushed into the water and managed to get Tina out, but by this moment, and despite trying to resuscitate her for almost an hour, it was too late, and she was already dead. From the moment Tina's body was recovered, something wasn't adding up. The autopsy revealed she had died from drowning, but the air supply was fully operational. Even if Tina had lost consciousness or fainted during the dive, oxygen would have still been flowing in. Witnesses who were diving in the same reef mentioned seeing Gabe embracing his wife in a long hug before seeing her sink to the bottom and him swimming back to the surface. They also didn't understand how Gabe, who was a trained rescue diver, hadn't been able to bring Tina up in an emergency. All of these contradictions made investigators work on the theory that this was no accident at all. They thought there was a possibility that Gabe had switched off Tina's air supply, held her until she was unconscious, and then switched it back on before letting her sink. This theory seemed to gain strength when Tina's father mentioned that a few weeks before the wedding, Gabe had suggested she increase her life insurance policy, adding him as the only beneficiary. Although Gabe had returned to the United States, in 2009 he finally travelled back to Australia to face a trial where he was being accused of murder. Prosecutors used evidence from the diving equipment, as well as the witness testimonies to build a case, and Gabe's own testimonies against him. Throughout the investigation, he had given 16 different versions of what happened, none of which matched what several witnesses had seen underwater. There was also no explanation as to why, as an experienced rescue diver, he had not known how to activate alternative air supply, or brought her to the surface seeing she was in trouble. Gabe Watson pleaded not guilty to murder, but guilty to manslaughter, for which he was given four years in prison. He served only 12 months. Tina's family attempted to take Gabe to trial in the United States as well, since they believed the plot to murder Tina was already in the making before they even got married. However, a judge dismissed the case due to lack of evidence and acquitted Gabe Watson, who is, as of today, a free man. What do you think really happened during that dive? Leave a comment and let me know your thoughts down below. This is the last footage captured of 16-year-old Angeles Rosen walking home after a gym class. Minutes later, the doorman of her building would snatch her and try to assault her. Angeles fought back, but the man was much larger than her and ended her short life by suffocating her. On June 10th, 2013, Angeles Rosen was walking home to her family apartment in Buenos Aires, Argentina. She'd just finished her gym class, and a security camera on her street filmed how she was almost home at 9.52. However, she never actually entered her house. When she got into the building, the doorman, Jorge Mangieri, asked her to go with him to a secluded area. 
It's unclear what he told her to convince her to go with him, but since Angeles knew him since she was a child and saw him every day, she completely trusted him and accepted. Once they were out of sight, Jorge tried to assault her. Angeles fought back from the beginning, scratching and kicking her aggressor, but the 16-year-old was small and Jorge managed to impose his strength over her. During the attack, he fractured several of her ribs and finally suffocated her to death by covering her mouth and nose with his hand. However, the most chilling part of the story is how he attempted to cover his tracks. He stuffed the teen's body into a bag and threw it into the building's bins. The next day, the body would be found by employees of the city's waste management. As soon as the body was found, Angeles' last steps were retraced, and thanks to the cameras installed around her neighborhood, investigators located her last moments. Naturally, after seeing she was entering her building that morning, they asked the doorman if he remembered seeing her. Seeing Jorge Mangiari's state, police immediately suspected he was involved. He was covered in bruises and scratches, and although he tried to cover the truth at first, the suspect quickly caved and confessed. DNA testing would later prove Angeles had traces of Jorge's skin under her nails, confirming he was the one who attacked her. Jorge Mangeri was given life in prison for the murder of Angeles Rosen and is still serving his sentence today. On May 10th, 2021, Dustin Williams from Tennessee decided to go on a hike with his dog. On his walk, he took several pictures and even went live on Facebook for his weekly virtual Bible study. However, shortly after sending this picture to his family, he went silent. Twelve days later, his body would be recovered from the trail he was hiking on. Curtis Dustin Williams was 43 years old and lived in Tennessee along with his wife and daughters. He was a devoted father and a man of faith. Every week, he hosted a Bible study session on Facebook Live. He was a lover of the outdoors and enjoyed nature every time he could. In fact, as a job, he led mountain tours, so going on hikes was something he did often. He was experienced and knew the trails very well. That day, May 10th, he told his wife of 20 years he would be going for a quick hike to host his Bible study Facebook Live from the mountain. He would only be gone for a few hours, and he would meet the family later on for dinner. He took the dog and was on his way. The weather was good, just a few clouds scattered along the sky, and Dustin hosted his Facebook Live, where his family also tuned in to watch, as they always did. After finishing his live stream, he made his way home, only he never actually made it home. After a few hours of not hearing from him, his wife and daughters began to call him, but his phone kept going straight to voicemail. Perhaps he ran out of battery, they thought, but as time kept moving forward, his wife sensed that wasn't the case, so she drove to the park where Dustin was hiking at. There, she found that his truck was still in the parking lot, so he was bound to still be somewhere along the trail. After speaking to the park officials and getting the police involved, the search began. Hundreds of officers and volunteers searched the massive pocket wilderness, but found no signs of Dustin. After the third day of searching, the family dog's body was recovered, making it even clearer that something must have happened to Dustin while he was hiking. It would still take another nine days to find out. On the twelfth day of searching, Dustin Williams' body was found at the bottom of a cliff. The fall had been too much and he hadn't survived. It's not clear exactly when Dustin fell, but since he kept a very active communication with his family during his hike, this picture might have been taken just moments before his accident. The Williams family has set up a GoFundMe page to help with all of the expenses that come along with losing a loved one, especially to an accident, since Dustin didn't have life insurance. The link will be in the description if you're interested in learning more about how to help in this case. If you're finding the video interesting, please consider giving it a like. It really helps out the channel, and I appreciate it very much. This is the last photo ever taken of 17-year-old Michelle Rogers. A few hours later, Michelle, along with her mother and younger sister, would be murdered and tossed into the waters of Tampa Bay. In 1989, Michelle, 
her mother Joan, and her sister Christy took a road trip to Florida, while their father stayed home taking care of the farm. After a fun-filled week where they visited theme parks and landmarks, they headed to the last stop of their trip, Tampa, where they wanted to relax by the beach. But when they arrived, they got lost and couldn't find their motel. That's when a stranger approached them and offered them help. He was kind to them and wrote down directions on how to get to the motel on the back of a brochure they had in their car. But then he offered something else. He had a boat and usually took it out to see the sunset from the bay. Since the three women were tourists, he offered to take them out that same evening. The three accepted and told the man they'd meet him at seven that night. After that, they went to the motel and spent the day out by the pool. While they were getting ready that evening, either Joan or Christy snapped this picture of Michelle on the floor of the room the three were sharing. A few minutes later, they left to go on the boat. Two days later, the motel's housekeeping noticed nobody had been back to their room for days, although all the luggage was still there. At the same time, three bodies were recovered floating in Tampa Bay. It was three women and the three of them had signs of violence on their lifeless bodies. They were soon identified as Joan, Michelle, and Christy Rogers. However, the clues to solve the mystery of how they ended up dead were almost non-existent. After finding their car, police found the brochure with the directions to the motel. After cross-examining the handwriting with everyone in the Rogers family, they determined it didn't belong to any of them, and suspected whoever wrote the note could know something about the murders, or even be the killer. So in an effort to find the suspect, and before the case went cold, police published the piece of evidence in newspapers and put up billboards all over Tampa showing the particularities of the handwriting. It was a long shot, but it actually worked. A few days later, a woman came forward with a quote she had from a contractor that did a job at her house. The handwriting was identical, and police finally had a lead. Oba Chandler was arrested and convicted of murdering the three women and later sentenced to death. Until his last day, he insisted he had nothing to do with it. If you're interested in this case, I have a full video on the details and how a piece of handwriting helped solve a case that put a man behind bars. This photograph was taken by Dalen Pua and sent to his family while he was on a hike in the Haiku Stairs in Hawaii. After that, they lost contact with a 17-year-old. After checking the photos Dalen sent to his family that morning, a mysterious figure is spotted among the wilderness. Investigators believe this stranger could hold the answers to what happened to Dalen, who, as of today, is still missing. The teenager was visiting his grandmother, and during his visit, he told her he planned to go on the Haiku Stairs hike. The popular Haiku Stairs, also known as Stairway to Heaven, is a steep steel structure that remains from a former US Navy communication facility on the island. The nearly 4,000 steps still remain, but since the facility was abandoned in 1987, nobody has done any maintenance and the hike is officially closed to the public. However, the view of the bay from the top is famous for being a beautiful one, and many hikers venture into the band trail anyway. This is what Dalen planned to do ignoring the advice from his grandmother, who told him it could be dangerous. Many of his friends on Facebook were also surprised he would go on such a dangerous hike, but he assured them it was okay. On the morning of February 26, 2015, Dalen was wearing a white long sleeve shirt, black surf shorts, and a red backpack when he made his way to the popular trail. This is the last thing he ever posted to his Facebook account. During the hike, he texted several pictures to his family, the scenery was beautiful, surrounded by the wilderness of the island. However, Dalen's grandmother was at home waiting for him to come back. She wasn't happy he'd decided to go on the hike against her advice. And when the hours went by, and Dalen went silent online, she began to get scared. That evening, after not hearing from him since the morning, she reported him missing. An extensive search began for Dalen, involving authorities who used volunteers, drones, and dogs to search for him. However, the teenager seemed to have just vanished, and there was no trace of him anywhere. There were no reports of bad weather or any other adverse conditions that could have trapped him. Nothing seemed to be out of place. He was just gone. Police asked to see the pictures he'd been texting his family to try and locate any clues that could help solve the mystery of what happened to Dalen, and that's where the story gets strange. 
In one of the pictures of the scenery the teen sent to his family, there are signs that Dalen wasn't alone on the trail. Whether he knew it or not is a mystery, but in one of the pictures, moving in between the bushes, the figure of what appears to be a man can made out. He's barely recognizable, and there are no signs that the man was necessarily following Dalen, but authorities think there is a connection between the disappearance and this stranger. A few days after the search began, witnesses who were also in the area around the Haiku stairs reported they heard cries for help, but they can't be certain it was Dalen who was shouting. The urge to identify the man in the photo grew and grew, but nobody seems to know who it may be. A week after he was reported missing, and with no signs of him or a body, the search for Dalen was called off. And although his family continued to search the trail on their own, to this day, nobody has ever seen or heard from Dalen again. Authorities are still trying to identify the man in the picture and his potential connection to the missing teen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoy content like this, please give it a like and subscribe to see more.